All right, thank you all for having me. I appreciate uh, the invite from Tom and, and uh, for all of y'all, what y'all do with Toolbox Ministries and, and showing up um, and uh, participating and getting a free meal out of the deal, so, so that's good. Um, but uh, like Tom said, I'm from Corpus and uh, I've, I've shared my story uh, several times. Um, well, a lot of times actually, but uh, it's it's always good to to say it, and it's it's a tough story. Um, I know a lot of people that have come to this before and spoken of you know kind of at the top of the game for their business or for whatever the reason. But uh, you know, mine is is a different story of I like to call it uh, you know tragedy to triumph. And um, you know, I've been through kind of the unspeakable, and I'm here to talk about it. And I, I made a, a a deal with God that I said if I was ever asked to you know, speak somewhere, and he got me through that. Uh, that I would do it, and so um, it's a, it's an it's an honor to be here, and I look forward to sharing with you. And hopefully, I don't keep you too long. But if you do, um, but just want to thank you all for being here. But my story starts, um, you know, back back when I was a child, and uh, a lot of folks thought that after Wimberley, you know, I found faith and found God, and and kind of came to my re religion. Um, but but it's not. Uh, it started back when. When I was a kid, and uh, my brother, who's here from Houston, I'm honored to have him here. Um, you know, we had parents that were, were drug addicts. Um, they, they drug us to Wednesday night church, and Saturday morning church, and Sunday morning church, and Jack, that one was for you, you know? And, uh, and, uh, and so we were at church all the time. And I can remember um, even when I was uh, in middle school that we were one of seven families that went to First Baptist Church in Corpus that were tasked to go to start another church, Yorktown Baptist. And uh, so at Caffey Middle School, I'd go to school five days a week, and then that's where we'd meet on Sundays. So for three years, I was at my middle school seven days a week, you know? <laughs> Couldn't wait to get out of that place. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so kind of to speed up a little bit, so that's where I kind of had my foundation of faith um, given to me and, and taught to me is, is through church as a child and having my parents, our parents, uh, take us as many times as we could. And, um, and so I leaned on that a lot, um, you know, after Wimberley. Um, growing up, you know, you kind of go to college and you kind of shy away from religion and, you know, do your own thing and then you get married and you kind of come back and, you know, you go back and forth quite a bit. Um, but, um, you know, it, it was fantastic um, you know with Laura and, and Andrew and Layton um, of, of them always every night wanting to wanting to pray at night at, at, at dinner and pray for everybody and you know I had to speed them up a little bit sometimes because they would just keep praying you know and and so that was a big uh, big deal to me um, looking back after what I've been through but the night uh, that I want to talk about and afterwards and I'll kind of go through the details, and, and um, it's a tough story. But anyway, we got to Wimberley, and I was, we were supposed to be um, in Mexico uh, with some friends, and it was going to be our 10-year anniversary, Laura and I's. And, uh, and I said, I don't want to dump the kids off with my parents anymore and, and wanted to you know, take them with us. And some really good friends of ours, Randy and Michelle Charba, and their little boy, Will, um, they have a river house in Wimberley. They had asked us many times to come, and I uh, just... We just couldn't make it. And so I said, you know, hey, let's go. Memorial weekend, it's a long weekend, it's gonna be beautiful. Let's do that instead. So, so that's where we went. And uh, that morning of uh, May 24th, 2015, um, we all woke up and I went for a long walk, took our dogs with us and the kids and everybody else and the girls and, and, um, and went for a walk. Came back and, and the girls wanted to keep going so they kept going and, and we, jumped in the river with the kids and the dogs and we started pushing them down the river in tubes and you know somebody'd be down here and they'd get out run back up float down run back up and just your typical day um, sunshine uh, had barbecue pit going had brisket cooking I mean just couldn't ask for a better day and I'm glad I had that day um, to look back now um, because it was such a a wonderful experience of um, um, hanging out as a family Later on that day, um, it got, you know, there was a little bit of, uh, you, you know, we never knew it was going to flood, obviously, um, or we wouldn't have been there. But, uh, you know, 
a little bit of sprinkles here and there and there'd be some people floating by and it'd, it'd rain a little bit and hey y'all want to get out now we're okay we're good and uh, so we just continued to stay there and uh, Michelle's dad uh, Randy's father-in-law we had all our trucks down by the river and they said hey put them up on the hill we're supposed to have a little bit of rise in the river and and we don't want the trucks to you know get wet okay no problem so we have dinner um, and uh, and then all the everybody goes to sleep Randy and I stay up and do what guys do looking at the river and have the music going and and just kind of sitting there and talking and I can remember you know you can hear this this noise and uh, you know we didn't know what the noise was and just kept thinking we said man it sounds like water but but uh, don't know and so we'd have a flashlight and we're we're looking at the river and it's it's moving a little faster but it's still inside the banks keep watching it keep watching it doesn't move doesn't comes up a little bit comes up a little bit and then all of a sudden it starts coming up a little quicker and uh, and so the water comes up and the house is built on stilts and so the bottom floor is about 15 foot off the ground and then it's a two-story house um, so anyways and so the bottom is built to have all the walls blow out of it in case there is a flood and there's a little little deck in there that you can put the lawnmower and kayaks and things so that if it does blow out that doesn't get wet well, anyways um, we're there and um, the water starts to come up we put everything up on the deck um, and we said you know hey let's let's get everybody out of here I, I you know kind of have a bad feeling or you know he does too so we go upstairs wake everybody up and I can remember it took about 10 minutes to get everybody down out of the beds and hey let's let's get out of here and at this point we walk back outside and it's about six foot deep um, around the house and um, and I said man this isn't good and uh, and so we can't get out now at this point it's it's the water's moving pretty good so I said the only way to get out behind the house it's about um, 20 yards to dry land um, but it's pretty deep and so I said you know let me go downstairs and get get a get a, uh, a water hose and I said if I can rope that tree limb you know I can kind of get to my truck and get a bunch of ropes and I have a bunch of you know carabiners and everything that I could sling people out and kind of you know rescue them uh, I'm not thinking so I get a chair break out the window um, and I'm standing on an air conditioner unit that's outside on stilts and I can feel it moving and Randy's holding my shorts um, so I don't take off and then uh, I get the the uh, the water hose across the limb but I can't get back to it I can't get it on there to tie a knot so I said okay that's not gonna work we'll just stay here I come back they pull me back inside and at that moment boom a, a tree or something hits that air conditioner unit takes it um, right where I was standing and uh, and so water starting to come in the the window a little bit now that we broke out and I said well let's just you know go sit in the living room and see what happens and, and hopefully it goes back down and so they're, you know, the kids are in their pajamas and everybody's in pajamas and all of a sudden we just feel this thud. And, uh, and at that moment it hits and then the entire house is floating. Um, it, the whole thing knocked off the foundation. So we're in the house um, floating down the river and I know about a quarter mile down the river is the Ranch Road 12 bridge. And, uh, and so we, we get in the front of the house, the windows, and everybody's sitting in couches and chairs and they're whatever and we have flashlights looking to see where we're going to hit the bridge so that we know where we can need to be inside the house so that we don't get taken out well we didn't hit a piling but the water was so high already that when we got to the bridge it stopped us for about a second and a half and the whole second story of the house comes off it was already up that high but it took the whole story off and so at that point you know the glass breaking sheetrock two by fours everything's falling on top of you um, you know everybody's kind of displaced and we do a head count and um, and so we're all there and then all of a sudden you know we at that moment and during the head count we noticed that Sue uh, which is Michelle's mother and, and Randy's stepmom is not there or, or mother-in-law and uh, and you can hear from the back of the debris pile and it's dark at this point I mean it's pitch black dark and rain and and uh, and you just hear you know help me you know somebody help me and so I crawl across all the debris and um, 
and and she's hanging out a win she's on the outside of the house on this debris pile um, and so I reach through to grab her well all of a sudden more debris gets piled up in between us and wet and I'm the last one to touch her and I couldn't hold on to her and there she goes pretty tough to to know about that um, and we keep going down the river and this is not smooth like this patio up here um, it's it's pretty rough water and everywhere and our debris pile gets bigger and smaller as as we go down and uh, at this point um, we're still kind of in chairs and uh, and all of a sudden you know these huge cypress trees that you see in all these beautiful pictures are now in the middle of this river and um, and we hit a tree and it splits that platform in half and that's the last time that I saw or talked to Randy and Michelle and Will. Um, and so now, floating down the river, it's uh, myself, Laura, Andrew, Layton, and Ralph, who owns the house, and Maggie, um, our dog. And he's up there and he found some uh, um, mattresses. And so we're kind of on these two different single mattresses. And, uh, and we're continuing going down the river and it's bad um, but I'm trying to keep them calm and you know hey it's okay we're gonna ride this thing as far as we can you know we're gonna if it takes us to Mexico the Gulf of Mexico will take it and um, so we're traveling and I mean it's it's I've been whitewater rafting before and that's about what it was um, and all of a sudden we our debris piles getting smaller and so I actually throw Maggie off of the the pile because I'm not gonna let her take up room for human life um, and so at this point we hit some more water um, and uh, and come to wipe our eyes kind of do a head count again and uh, and Ralph isn't there it's just Laura Andrew Layton and myself and I hear you know help me somebody help me well he's in the front of the pile so I crawl over there um, put my arms under both his shoulders and drag him back to the pile where we are. Um, and so we're continuing to float down the river. More water, we hit some more white water rapids and uh, take count again and uh, Ralph is now gone. We don't see him again. So it's just us four. And I can remember cruising, cruising down the river, um, you know, seeing Layton and her little nightgown hearts all over it and Andrew and his you know um, um, superhero pajamas and, and Laura and her clothes hit some more water and um, and and we come to and do a head count and I look and and it's just Laura and Layton my six-year-old boy is gone and all of a sudden I hear from the back of the pile um, Daddy, help me. Daddy, help me. One of the worst things I've ever heard. I jump to the back of the pile to get Andrew. And I get a hold of him, start crawling back, hit some more water, lose grip of him, and it's the last time I ever see my wife and kids on our 10-year anniversary weekend. I'm now in the water by myself, um, knowing what just happened and what's gonna happen probably to, to them and possibly to me. And all of a sudden, right next to me is Maggie in the water. And someone told me after laying in the hospital that the speed of the water that I'm cruising in um, is about 40 miles an hour, which is the speed of water going over the Niagara. Where I started and where I came out, was 11 miles long and so during this time after I see Maggie just for the second you know I thought man what is she doing here keep going down and, I, and and I'm in the middle of the river and I can remember I can't get out of the current and I hit this cypress tree extremely hard and it turns me around hit my head on a limb and I go under and I start doing everything I can to, to come up above the water and um, I finally think I'm above water, take this huge breath of, of air, realizing it's nothing but water, and I'm under the water, not knowing which way is up or down. And uh, 
And so I come up and I take one more big breath and I know I'm above water. And as soon as I do that, I get sucked back under. And, um, and at that point, I've spent all energy that I have. I have nothing left in me, nothing in the tank. And, uh, and I can remember underwater praying to God, God, I just want to die right here. I want to die and just be with my family. I don't want to go any further. And so I just gave up and went limp and said, take me home. As soon as I do that, I hit my head and just about crush it on something under the water and just see the white lights of, um, you know, like kind of when you get knocked out somehow. I said, okay, God, if this is going to be me getting out of here, I'm going to need your help, and we'll tell this story. And so at that moment, I come up above water, and, uh, and I said, okay, I need to kind of go into survival mode, and, uh, and I, need, I need help. So I see all this debris floating by, and I grab this one log, knowing that if I can hold onto a log that's above water, I'm not going to get sucked back under. And this log is, I mean, slick as snot, and, uh, and can barely even hold on to it. And it's just one log. Well, then I see another one coming by me that's in the shape of a V. And so I said, let me get a hold of that one so that, and I got in the middle. So anything in front of me I hit would hit that log first. Anything coming behind me would hit the back of the log. And I never did, like, think six steps ahead. I thought of the next step, and then the next step, and then the next step. And, um, and so I did that, and I said, okay, let me, what do I need to do now? I need to, I need to get out of this water. And uh, so I'm, I see some tree limbs, and the only time I can really see anything is when lightning stri- strikes, you know, from the, from the, from the light, and, uh, and, and see some, lim- some limbs coming up. And uh, at this point, it's, it's definitely raining um, heavy. Um, and so I grab a hold of this first set of limbs, and of course I had to get away from my safety net of that log, grab the limbs, and again, this is at 40 miles an hour, grab the limb, and it just snaps off. And I continued down the river. So I said, okay, I need another limb. So I grab a hold of this next limb, and I'm able to hold on. And I, I mean, with everything I have, I hold on to this limb and think that I'm at the top of a tree, you know, because of the water level. And as I'm crawling through it, and I can remember thinking, man, this is weird, but the whole back of the tree is about to float. So this tree is laid over, and that root ball is fixing to come up, and I'm fixing to go with the tree. So I crawl through as fast as I can, and, um, and I realize that on the other side of this tree is ground. So I kind of just, as much as I can just fall on top of it, I, I fall on top of it. And all it was was bark that had been built up in this little water area, area on top. So then I have to swim over and crawl across this, this land. And I get there, and uh, um, I lay on the ground, and realize that, uh, you know, I can't go around and I can't go back because it's kind of like a peninsula. The only thing I can do is go up, and it's a cliff straight up behind me. And um, so I said, okay, let me try this. And at this point, I have one river shoe on and a pair of board shorts, and that's it. No, t- no T-shirt, nothing else with me. And uh, so I start scaling this cliff upwards with water coming down on me. Um, get about 30 feet up, and, uh, and I fall back down to the ground, you know. Um, and I said, okay, let me move over a little bit. I don't want to take that route again. I crawl up again, about another 30, 35 foot, fall back, land in the water. Got back to that starting point again, and I remember praying. I said, God, if you're going to get me out of here and we're going to tell your story, I need some help. And just kept praying. I need help, I need help. So I start up again for the third time and I get to a little levee or a little incropping on this cliff and, and, it's, and I said, let me get in here, this little cave. And uh, the only thing I can do as I'm crawling, you know, of course my legs are not working, my arms aren't working, I'm pretty beat up. And then I said, I gotta jump up to this edge and um, I try to jump and my left leg won't work. And uh, so I change legs and have to pick one leg up, put it on a rock, and uh, jump with my other leg. And then for me not to slide back down to the river, I just let all the rocks and the rock face grip my skin and just 
hold me there. So I start crawling into this cave, little bitty cave. And, uh, and I can remember looking across the river at a house that still has some power on it, and I try and yell at them, you know, help, help, help. Of course, nobody's going to hear me with the sound of the water and everything else going on that night. And realize that I can't even yell. It hurts so bad to yell, and I don't know why at this point. And uh, so I'm, I said, I can't stay here because I know I'm going to die of pneumonia, or not, of uh, hypothermia. I was shivering, one, because I knew what happened to, to my family and know that they're not going to survive. Two, because of hypothermia, I said, I have to get out of here. I'm, I'm a dead man here. So I look down the, the cliff face and I see some more bushes hanging out. And so I said, let me start scaling sideways across this, this cliff. And, uh, and I get to that bush and I grab a hold of it and not knowing that every blade on there is a serrated blade and, uh, and just hold on to it. It's got a good root system and I pull on it and I go to the next bush and the next bush and the next bush to where I'm laying on some flat surface but in the middle of nowhere. And I said, okay, let me, now that I'm here, let me try and find my way out of the bushes and, uh, and the brush. And all of a sudden I can remember seeing, you know, those, like a bag chair you take to the beach. I see a chair set up over here on this cliff. And I said, well, you know, somebody brought that chair here. You know, where's the trail that they're on um, that, that made them come down here? So I start looking for the trail. And I go down one route and know that that's not the way I come back. Try another one and realize I can kind of make out a trail. And uh, at that point, I start walking, not knowing what's underneath me or on the sides of me. Slip, fall, hit my face, start sliding back down. Grab a hold of a tree, tree root and, um, and I, I don't let go again until I get to the top. And it's a big, you know, kind of... Um, switchback trail um, all the way to their house and uh, and I don't know there's a house there and and so I, I get to the top and this is probably 75 100 yards of switchback that I go up and um, and fully overgrown and um, so I get to the house and there's all these trucks you know in, in the parking lot and, uh, and I said well that's good somebody's home and uh, and so I go knock on this door and uh, thinking it's the front door, but it's actually a door to the garage, a uh, man door, and which is a good thing because they have about 12 dogs and kennels. They had been at a, uh, a competition that weekend, you know, for, for retrieving and jumping and everything else, and so all the dogs start barking, um, wake everybody up, and they come downstairs and uh, don't even know the river's flooding. They're out of power, but don't know that the river's flooding. So they come outside and they said, you know, and at that point I kind of just fall, um, beat up and, and not looking good. And uh, they said, where'd you come from? I said, the river. And they said, there's no way that you ever came from that river, you know, from here. And I said, I came from right down there. And, uh, and they said, there's no way. There's no physical way that you could do that. And I said, I did. And I said, and, and everybody that was in the house with me is gone. And I said, we need to find them named off every single person that was with me, and she had some medical experience, so she asked me, you know, a bunch of questions that I should know um, to make sure that I didn't have any head trauma. Then they dressed me in sweatpants and sweatshirts and actually gave me a bunch of water to drink um, because she knew that I was, you know, dehydrated and, and adrenaline rushing, and so we sit there, and it, it took the uh, ambulance about an hour to get to us um, because of all the creeks that were backed up and they couldn't get around, and, and um, they load me up, and take me there. They're supposed to take me to, to Austin, um, to the ER there, but they can't get across 35 because the water's now going over Highway 35. And, um, and so they take me to San Marcos, and I can remember um, they put me on the MRI table uh, and where you have to slide all the way in and come back out and, and you know, cut everything off, and here's a piece of meat on the table. And, uh, and I can remember they... They went to take my wedding ring off, and I said, you're not taking my wedding ring off. And they said, you, we have to, you know, inside there. And I said, well, I said, I'm going to watch you the entire time, and if you walk away with my wedding ring, I'm coming out after you. <laughs> he stood there the entire time. And, uh, and they went to go put the, the uh, before that, they checked my heart rate and everything, but they go to put on the, the, the arm 
deal. And I just yell at them, and they're like, you know, you know what's going on? And, and it's just cactus throughout my entire side, um, you know, and just beat up. And uh, so they get inside, and, and I go for the MRI deal, and come to find out the reason I can't yell is because back on the rivers, I have a broken sternum, broken ribs, a punctured lung, um, busted legs, and everything else. And so at this point, they, they put in a, a, a catheter and a, uh, a lung tube, and they tell me the two worst procedures are a lung tube and a catheter, and so I nailed those. Um, <laughs> But at this point, I'm now trauma, and I need to be sent to, to Bamsey in San Antonio, um, which is a big Army-based hospital and, and a teaching hospital. Um, so we get to Bamsey, um, and the only person I can remember a phone number to, because everybody has phones now, you just dial their name, is my brother Darren in Corpus. And uh, he answers the phone, and, and I tell him what's going on. And, and uh, actually, the, the paramedic has to take the phone and say, hey, you know, this is where we're going and it's not good. And so they get in the car and take off. I get to BAM seat and uh, apparently the doctors over there don't agree with the lung procedure that they did. And so they bring in the students um, and a tray and they're going to redo it. So they're awa I'm awake the whole time and they pull this lung tube out and they go, the doctor's over here and the students are putting it all in. This is a little side story. And, uh, and they go in, and if you've ever had a lung tube, you're awake and you can feel it going through your ribs, you can feel it going through everything, and, and it's miserable. And the doctor just says, hey, that's the wrong angle. Pulls it out. Try again. Wrong angle. I look at the doctor, I said, you want to take a stab at this? Or you should let them do it the whole time. And, uh, so anyways, and, and I'm, they said, raise your hands up while we do this. I said, I can't pick up my arms or shoulders or anything, so somebody's back there holding them. And uh, they go in the, the third time, and I said, I don't know how deep you need to go, but I can feel you on the back of my spine. And, uh, and they pull it out, tape it up, and there we go. But I lay in the hospital, and, and I think to myself, and I cried for days, um, days and there's people coming in left and right thousands of people it felt like hundreds for sure and I cried for two different reasons one um, knowing the loss that I knew happened um, at this point nobody's been found or recovered and uh, and two of the just humanity coming out to help because thousands showed up out of nowhere to search for my family I think within 24 hours, we had 13 helicopters in the air searching uh, down the river, um, and thousands of people just on the ground, ground pounders going every which way, you can get, putting their own lives in, at risk uh, to try and find my family. And so, obviously cried lots for days and scared, stared at ceiling tiles and, and had thoughts and prayed and just, I, I've never felt more empty in my life. And um, I finally get out. They haven't uh, recovered anybody. And I can remember the first day, um, I think it was five days I got out of the hospital, uh, that, that uh, I go up in a helicopter with a friend of mine. And I said, we got to go find them. So I fly up. And if you're on a search team, you have three different colors of marking tape, flagging tape, green for positive ID, yellow, don't search again, pink, you know, point of interest. And so we're flying over some guys and I see some people I know from Corpus and they pull out this long strip of, of uh, green tape. And I said, hey, they got somebody, you know, put it down, put it down. So we fly back around, we land and they said, what is he doing here? Why, why is he here? And I get out stumbling over there and they catch me and they said, no, you're not going over there. And I said, I said, I just need to know if it's a male, female, child, what? And um, they said, you need to leave. And I said, I just need to know. And they said, it's a, it's a female. And I said, okay. And I sat out on this log. And uh, they all kind of turned their backs. And I get up because I knew where they were. And I take off as fast as I can, stumbling. And they grabbed me. And I said, get him out of here. So I get up. We leave. Get back to the headquarters. And every time that there's 
there's three detectives assigned to us uh, for each family. And so my detective, Angelo Florian, um, calls me that evening and we're standing in the lobby of uh, the hotel that I'm staying in, or we're all staying in. And uh, he said, where are you? And I said, I'm at the hotel. And I'm standing there with my parents, my brother, um, our preacher, uh, First Baptist Church, who this was his second weekend to be preacher at First Baptist Church. I'd been, on the, I'd been on the search committee for two years to try and find him, and this was his second weekend. And um, anyway, he says, well, I heard they found Laura today. And I said, how did you hear that? And, uh, you know, I'm not a social media guy. And he said, well, it was on Facebook. And I said, really? Angelo calls, and obviously he says, he's, I'm on the way. I'm on the way. He comes over, and he's soaking wet, and uh, he goes, I need to go somewhere and talk to you. So we go up to the hotel room and he said, you know, we, we found Laura. Earlier that day where I was, that was Sue, um, Michelle's mother. So we go in the hotel room and he said, you know, it's not a positive ID on um, anybody until we do medical records and everything else. He said, but uh, do you know what kind of wedding ring she was wearing? And I said, yeah. And, uh, he said, well, what kind is it? And I said, well, I don't know the cut of it, but, you know, I could recognize it. And he said, okay, well, I'm going to show you a picture, but, you know, can't do much more. So standing in that hotel room, I identified my bride by her wedding ring that was still on her finger. Of course, lose it again, knowing for sure um, and so that I, now that I know that I've heard that somebody put it on Facebook, I don't want her parents to know. They live in New Braunfels, and so I get my dad to drive me to New Braunfels because I'm not going to let them find out on Facebook. Just me being a man, I said, I'm going to go tell them myself. And so if, if you ever think that it's hard to ask a man's daughter's hand in marriage, you know, ask them. It's a lot tougher telling them that we just located your daughter. Um, in a river. Big moment. Um, so I leave there, I come back and, uh, you know, continue on the search for days and days and they find, they find Andrew, locate Andrew, they find Randy, they find Michelle, they find Ralph. To this day we still haven't found Leighton or Will. Um, after that, I joined, joined a search and rescue team, and uh, we'd search with dogs and dogs and for years and years. But two years later, um, I took two excavators down to the river and dug it out where we had locations of dog scents and uh, didn't find anything, but I did find Le Leighton's blanket um, two years later, which was some closure. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you, when I finally got back home, you know, several weeks later after being in Wimberley, I'd lay in bed and uh, quiet. You know, when you have a couple kids, all you want is some peace and quiet, and now that's all I have. And it was terrifying. I mean, I sat on the couch and cried, males piling up, and I had my ups and downs and my struggles. And the further I got away from Christ, the worse things would be. The closer I would get to Him, they were still bad, but I had some comfort there. But I can remember, you know, sitting on the couch one day in one of my low moments thinking, I don't want to live again. I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. So on the, on the coffee table, I have a bottle of whiskey and a, and a, and a pistol. I think I'm done. I don't, I don't want this anymore. I'm, I'm out. And I prayed again. And I prayed again. And I said, I'm not, I'm not going out like this. I'm ready to deal with God. If I help me get out of that river, then I'm going to tell this story. He didn't let me down, so I'm not going to let him down. Put it away. And after that, about a week later, I'm in bed asleep. And uh, I wake up, or lay in bed asleep. And all of a sudden, I have this dream. It was a huge turning point for me. This dream is me talking to Leighton, crystal clear, talking to her, beautiful little girl, four years old, 
brown hair blowing in the wind, and I can see Laura and Andrew in the background in this tall green wheat field playing, just like you see in the movies. And then I said, you know, hey, Leighton, you know, where are you? Where are you? And uh, she said, you know, we're okay. And I said, well, where are you? You know, we're looking for you. And she said, we were picked up by a man in the river. And I said, you know, what man picked you up in the river? She said, that man was Jesus. I wake up from that dream, look down the hallway, hoping I'm going to see her running down the hallway, hoping to see them running across the hall to go to the bathroom. I never have that dream again, never finish the dream, but I know the outcome. I know that I was that parent, you know, that drug her to Wednesday night, drug her to Sunday morning. Every night, she's praying at dinner, praying for everybody. And so, so coming out of that, that was a huge moment for me because that was kind of like, you know, hey, I know where you are. And I'll tell you, you know, I spoke at the memorial of my own family in probably 45 minutes, an hour. And I told everybody, I said, where everybody was located. I said, uh, you know, Laura was located and found on the prettiest piece of property in Hayes County, just like she was. Andrew, he was found at the park where kids would play and families would have fun and barbecue. And I told him, Leighton's favorite game was hide and go seek. But the problem with hide and go seek, you're not supposed to be able to find the other person. And I know where she is, you know, in heaven, where she's supposed to be. And having that dream was just monumental for me, um, reassuring. And uh, so, you know, as I continued, you know, to kind of build my life back, it was a lot of reading, a lot of uh, devotionals, a lot of music um, that I listened to that just kind of speaks to you at different times. And there's music that I listened to prior to Wimberley. The words meant so much different after Wimberley, so much more. Um, a lot of Christian music. I don't know if y'all ever listened to just going on the highway of Christian music, but there's some great songs out there and they're not all, you know, the old school, you know, choirs just singing. It's, it's some bands and some good, good music. But, um, you know, as, as I, as I continue to go further timeline away from Wimberley, I can always look back and see that God was with me in the entire time. You know, that tree branch that was out there in the river, God's hand. And that tree branch that was on the bank, God reaching out, I got you. I'm not going to let you go. And so I encourage people whenever I talk or whenever I just talk to them one-on-one -on -one that, you know, I don't know what's going on in your life. The guy sitting next to you at the table, they don't know what's going on in your life, but God does. You know, it could be job-related. It could be family-related. It could be relationship. It could be addiction. It could be medical, cancer, anything, you know. God's not going to take away some of the parts that, you know, are tough. It's not going to make it easy. But knowing that he's there, there's comfort with that, that you can go to him and talk to him and just that peace of mind. And so from what I've learned after Wimberley, it's, it's the little things that, uh, that I take away from life now. You know, after, after that, I was introduced to uh, my, now, my now wife, Monica Cedars McComb. We were fortunate enough to have a little baby girl named Scarlett Grace. And the other day, as many of y'all who have kids here um, know what a pain in the butt it is to put those little safety clips on all the cabinets so they won't open them up and pull everything out. I bought those and started putting them on and just said, what a blessing this is that I get the chance and the opportunity to put on this little clip. Most of the time when I go speak places, you know, um, I'm by myself and, and uh, wake up and have devotional and just kind of get my mind right. I didn't have that chance this morning because I was laying in bed with Scarlett watching Coco Melon, you know, and, and I looked at that as a blessing. How awesome is that? Amen. And so I encourage you, no matter what you're going through, don't look at things as being tough. 
Look at them as being a blessing. Look at it the other way, you know, because there's so many things in life right now that so many bad things in this world, we got enough bad things to look at. You know, it starts with one person to, you know, turn your life around and, 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 to, and to make an impact for somebody else. And that impact, you know, for me, talking to people and coming to things like this is helpful to me to kind of reconnect me again with God, um, with people, to help people. And uh, so, you know, um, again, I, I just, you know, it's, it's the little things in life that you need to look at. And, and I've seen lives changed. I've seen relationships changed. I, 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 there's a girl, quick story. Um, that, that I knew in high school, and I knew in college a little while, atheist, addicted to drugs, and I saw her after Wimberley a couple years, and uh, she goes, I want to tell you, the way you lived your life, and the way you live your life, of uh, talking to people, encouraging people, I put down drugs and started reading the Bible, and her friends that were still doing drugs, they said, you know, what, what, is, what, what is your deal? You know, you have this extra giddy up in your step, you know, this extra joy for life, what are you doing? And they said, I started reading the Bible. So she's now out there worshiping and telling people, how cool is that? You know, and I always said, wherever I go, if there's one person that's impacted, then it was worth the drive over here, drive wherever, the travel. And so, as I wrap this up, I just want to thank you all for, for being here, for letting me open up. Hopefully, you know what I've said, um, will uh, change the way you think of something. When you go open that cabinet think, man, what a blessing I have to do anything that you can. So thank you all for being here. Tom, thank you for inviting me. And God bless all of y'all with whatever y'all do.